So, uh, could I have your attention, please? Uh, if our subject matter wasn't so sobering, I'd say that uh, this had almost a festive air to it, and it's a delight to see so many people coming out on such a, a cold evening, a rarity uh, in this uh, particular city. Uh, but uh, you're, you're certainly very welcome. So, my name is Paul Davies, and I'm director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. Uh, we're hosting uh, this evening. Our motto is confronting the big questions, and one of those questions is cancer. Every family in the country is touched by cancer in some way, which is why scientists around the world have spent decades intensively studying it. A few weeks ago, the National Cancer Institute, in a spectacularly enlightened initiative, created 12 new centers around the country in which physicists, chemists, engineers, and computer scientists are invited to share their own unique insights with the cancer research community in the hope of opening up a, a new front in the proverbial war on cancer. I have the privilege of heading up the center based here at Arizona State University, and tonight marks the launch of our outreach program in which we'll be sharing our cutting-edge research with other scientists in the field and also uh, within the network and beyond and the wider public. Now, to implement our research program, the Beyond Center has teamed up with the Ira Fulton School of Engineering, the Physics Department, the Biodesign Institute, the Mayo Clinic, and uh, last but not least, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, known to most people as the Hutch. Now, at the Beyond Center, we take public outreach very seriously. It is, after all, taxpayer dollars, your dollars, that are going to support our new cancer program. And we intend to keep you fully informed on how we're using that money to advance our understanding of cancer in novel ways, and how studying cancer may provide new insights into the nature of life itself. We could not want for a better inaugural lecturer than Dr. Lee Hartwell. Dr. Harpel is currently president and director of The Hutch, which is in fact uh, the largest freestanding medical research institute. He has a 40-year record of research excellence, much of it having a direct bearing on cancer, and in 2001 he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on a class of genes that control the cell cycle and are implicated in cancer when they malfunction. I'm happy to say that Dr. Harpel is currently in a state of transition to Arizona State University, where he's been appointed as co-director of the Sustainable Health Program in the Biodesign Institute and executive chairman of the Arizona-based Partnership for Personalized Medicine. His presentation tonight, with the title, What Have We Learned from Cancer?, will be followed by an opportunity to ask questions. Now, before we start, could I ask you to turn off your cell phones, pages, anything else that may go bleep and disturb the evening's proceedings. And then, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce to you Dr. Lee Harper. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be with you tonight, uh, to be here at uh, Arizona State University. Uh, we came here to get warm, and uh, <laughs> we're hoping that'll happen. Um, <clears throat> Also, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak uh, in this event for the Center uh, for Beyond, the Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, um, and um, also to be part of this um, Center for Sustainable Health that we're starting here at ASU. I would be more impressed if I didn't discover recently that um, every faculty member at ASU has a center. Did you know that? <laughs> It's true, actually. Um, so, um, let's see, I've got to put my slides here. Okay, um, so if you noticed my title, What Have We Learned From Cancer, you might have puzzled a little about um, why I didn't say, What Have We Learned About Cancer? Um, and this was a deliberate choice, not just poor English, uh, because 
what I think we have learned by studying cancer is a great deal about the normal cell. Things that we would not have learned uh, had we not been trying to figure out what was going on in cancer. So it really is uh, what we've learned from cancer about the normal cell, but of course we've also learned about the cancer cell in the process. Now, um, let's just start with a few facts about cancer. Uh, first, um, cancer um, is usually uh, detected in a localized spot and um, is associated with one or another organs in the body. So we speak of lung cancer or breast cancer or pancreas cancer or prostate cancer. <clears throat> um, so this is the first characteristic that we notice about it is that it begins as something localized um, in an organ. Now, why is that? Um, the adult organs are not growing uh, and cancer is of course a problem because it is growing. So we might imagine that cancer develops from an organ um, as sort of a regression to a developmental stage when that organ was growing, maybe some part that didn't get turned off. <clears throat> um, another possibility might be that it's some rare renegade cell in the organ that just um, goes haywire. And um, to distinguish those possibilities, um, an experiment was done. This is a little bit of a complicated experiment, probably the most complicated experiment I'll talk about. Um, a number of years ago, that um, definitively showed that cancer begins in a, one, in a single cell in our bodies. And this is true for all types of cancers that have been examined. So what the basis of this experiment is that in uh, females um, who have two X chromosomes, only one of those chromosomes is active in any cell. And that's to balance for the fact that in men, there's only one X chromosome. And so in every, so men are only expressing one X chromosome and females only express one X chromosome in each cell. And if you look at a patch of tissue, um, so here's a sample of tissue taken from, let's say a very small area in a woman. Um, and you look at the expression of the genes on the X chromosome you find, and this is one I want to point over here, is that by separating out the two forms of an enzyme that exist on that X chromosome, that is coded for by that X chromosome, you find that the smallest patch of tissue you can take expresses both enzymes. That's because the cells are all mixed up. And even though each cell is making only one type, um, when you take a small patch of tissue, you get both types. But if you look at the cancer cell, I mean, if you look at a single cell, by taking just one of the cells out of that patch and growing it up into a colony, um, you find you only get one of the enzymes, as I mentioned. And another cell might give rise to the other enzyme. But if you look at the cancer, and this can be a big batch of cancer tissue, where the cancer cells are purified from the other cells, you find only one of the X chromosomes being represented. So that means that the cancer cell is like a single cell here. That cancer arose from a single cell. <clears throat> okay, so that's very important because it means cancer is extremely rare on a cellular basis. Our bodies contain 10 to the 13th cells. That's 10,000 billion cells. And cancers arise very rarely. Not everybody gets cancer, so less than one per individual. And over the course of our lifetime, we produce a thousand times that many cells. So it's really 10 to the 16 cells at risk to become cancer. And only occasionally one does that. <clears throat> now, here's another fact about cancer, <clears throat> which is that um, the incidence of cancer is very strongly related to age. So 
uh, young people tend not to get cancer, and older people in their 60s and 70s and 80s is where most of the cancer in the population occurs. So we might ask, well, you know, why is, why is this the case? Um, there are a lot of things that change with aging. Um, some of us lose our hair. Um, we, uh, we repair our wounds more slowly, uh, various kinds of things. And so you might think, well, maybe cancer is just something that develops in old age like other things develop in old age. <clears throat> Or another possibility um, is that cancer results as an accumulation of things, um, like you were going on a um, scavenger hunt. Um, wouldn't take very long if you only had to find one thing, but if you have to find 10 things, it takes a long time. And so the delay might be because things accumulate over time. Um, <clears throat> now, let me give you some other data that's relevant to this. Um, a very striking thing is that the incidence of cancer, uh, any particular type of cancer, varies enormously from different places in the world. Um, uh, very usually by a factor of 10 or more in incidence. So here's lung cancer in New Orleans, a rate of 110 per 100,000 people uh, per year. Uh, in uh, China, there's six uh, in this city. In prostate cancer, 91 here, one. In stomach cancer, Nagasaki, 82, Kuwait, four. So you see all of these are numbers greater than a factor of 10. Um, well, you might think that's because uh, the people are different and maybe they have different risks of cancer. But if you, and this of course has only been done a few times, but if you follow people who migrate from one place to another and look at their incidence of cancer over time, this has been done very carefully for Japanese who migrated to Hawaii, <clears throat> their cancer incidence changes to become not where they grew up, but in fact where they reside uh, over a period of 10 to 20, 30 years, the, the incidence changes. So that suggests it's not the people, but there's something about the place, some kind of perhaps exposure. And what we in fact know is that um, careful epidemiological studies have identified some of the sources of cancer as environmental agents. Sunlight um, can cause melanoma. Uh, smoking can cause lung cancer. Uh, HPV virus can cause um, cervical cancer. So we know there are environmental agents and that's probably the explanation here. <clears throat> now, so this raises the question of, you know, what are we being exposed to and what is it doing to the cells that is causing cancer? <clears throat> and uh, a very brilliant experiment was done um, 30 or 40 years ago by Bruce Ames, who was a bacterial uh, physiologist, study, person who studies bacteria. And um, he began looking at chemicals that were known to cause cancer in rats. So this is rats, the common animal for testing chemicals for causing cancer. And um, what he did was test the same chemicals to see if they would cause mutation in bacterial cells. So he would put bacteria, for example, on an antibiotic that they were sensitive to and they wouldn't grow. And he could plate billions of cells on a Petri dish with antibiotic. And he would expose them to the same chemicals that are known to cause cancer. <clears throat> and what he found was that there was over a 90% correlation between things that were carcinogenic in rats and things that were mutagenic in bacteria. Now mutagens are things that change the DNA. They change the genetic information. And so this says that many of the things that are likely to be causing the difference in incidence in cancer are in fact things that are interacting directly 
to damage DNA. Um, in fact, the exceptions, things that caused cancer in rats but didn't cause cancer in bacteria, turned out that they would cause cancer if you exposed them to a liver extract. That is, there were things that were metabolized in the rat to mutagenic substances but weren't themselves mutagenic to start with. <clears throat> okay, now, um, cancers um, undergo a developmental process where they change lots of things uh, in the cancer and in the body. And one of those things is, for example, the stimulation of the growth of blood vessels in order to feed the tumor, the source of food. Now, normal adult bodies don't uh, grow blood vessels. That's something we do younger in life when we're developing, and adults normally don't. But cancer cells um, stimulate the growth of blood vessels in the adult. So that's one new kind of uh, change. Another thing that cancer cells do is that they migrate in the body. So normal cells will stay in place and cancer cells will um, chew up the what's called the basement membrane here and migrate throughout the body. And that's of course how they um, uh, metastasize and form what are the life-threatening uh, growths throughout the body. <clears throat> so how is it that cancer cells develop these different uh, capabilities? And I'll, I'll give you a few other examples as we go on. Um, these are things that are you know, done by specialized cells at different times in development. For, whoops. For example, um, neural cells will undergo migration at an appropriate time during development. So we might think that maybe cancer cells are undergoing some kind of embryonic development, um, developmental program. Another possibility is that there's, um, the cancer cells are doing all kinds of crazy things. And that when we look for the tumor to produce a large growth, we're selecting by, by looking for that, we're selecting for the cells that are capable of forming a large growth. That is, we're actually selecting for things that are capable of reproducing, of migrating in the body, of stimulating a blood system. <clears throat> now, when cancer cells were compared with normal cells for looking at their mutation rate, just like um, uh, the experiment with bacterial cells, it was found that cancer cells have very high mutation rates compared to normal cells, 100 to 1,000 times greater. And this is um, a picture of the chromosomes of a cancer cell. Now, the chromosomes are the organelles within our cell that carry the genetic information. And if this were the chromosomes from a normal cell, what would you would see would be 23 pairs of chromosomes. And here's a nice normal pair here. And here's a nice normal pair up here. But you'll see most of them are in abnormal numbers. Three, four, um, many of them are present in four. Some of them are present in pieces where they've lost part of it. Some of them are rearranged where we have three different chromosomes joined together here. All sorts of chaotic things happening to the chromosomes of cancer cells. And so this is, I think, the most fundamental aspect of cancer and um, accounts for um, all of the capabilities that they have, as well as their resistance to treatment, is that they are undergoing mutation at a very rapid rate. And that mutation expresses itself in the numbers of chromosomes and the rearrangements of chromosomes. And if you were to actually determine the DNA sequence of these chromosomes, you would find thousands of changes. So they're making mistakes when they reproduce their chromosomes. 
uh, mistakes that normal cells don't make because normal cells can reproduce all the cells of the body and you will rarely find a cell that doesn't have 23 normal pairs of chromosomes. <clears throat> now, this kind of observation is what leads to an understanding of the normal cell. Because when we see a cancer cell doing this, we naturally wonder, why don't normal cells do it? Why are normal cells so accurate uh, that over uh, thousands of divisions, um, they keep producing normal cells? And so I want to take you through uh, the cell division process and talk about the kinds of errors that can happen and how those errors occur. So this is a typical diagram of a cell. And there's um, uh, three important parts to the cell division process. This represents a chromosome with its two strands of DNA. And during the cell division process, that has to get duplicated. So this is the part that duplicates all the subunits of the DNA uh, and, and makes a copy of it during this process. And that, that's completed here. And then the part that's going to mark the poles of the cell, the centrosome, duplicates as well. And that centrosome migrates across from its daughter so that it sets up the poles of the cells so the chromosomes can separate. The two duplicates can go to opposite poles. And then the third important part is this spindle here that forms only when the chromosomes are condensed and ready to separate. And it's the structure on which the chromosomes migrate toward the poles. And so when the DNA is duplicated, the poles have formed the spindle, the chromosomes migrate to opposite poles, the cell divides. And all uh, uh, 23 chromosome pairs, that is 46 chromosomes, will undergo this process in a human cell. And they'll do it perfectly every time, nearly every time. Whereas cancer cells, if you watch a cancer cell do this, you will see mistakes occurring on almost every cell. Now, where does the accuracy come from, and, and how do the errors occur? Um, this represents two normal pairs of chromosomes, and there would be 23 pairs in the human cell. Um, and so there are various errors that can occur. Let's imagine that um, the chromosomes don't line up properly on the spindle. And so instead of two going to each side, the two duplicates, we get three to one side and one to the other. Th then you would get an ab number, abnormal number of chromosomes. So that's an error on the spindle. An error can happen during DNA replication, during the duplication of the DNA, such that breaks occur in the DNA. And when the cell repairs those breaks, it can put together the wrong pieces if there's too many breaks in the cell. So this is an example where a break occurred between this chromosome and another one here, and the pieces got put back together wrong. And that's an example of those um, uh, rearranged chromosomes we saw in the cancer cell. And then the third kind of error that can happen is in the centrosome, which sets up the poles. In cancer cells, you will many times see um, a uh, single pole dragging all the sets of chromosomes to one side. And that's why that cell I showed you earlier had so many sets of four chromosomes, because um, there had been centrosome error at some time in its history. OK, well, we can understand how the errors occur, but why don't they occur in the normal cell? And this is something that uh, actually my lab was involved in investigating. Uh, uh, we used yeast cells, not human cells. But um, what um, we and others discovered was that humans, the normal cells, have elaborate mechanisms to prevent these kinds of errors from occurring. Um, let's just take the spindle. When the chromosomes are lined up on the spindle, if there's one chromosome sitting off to the side somewhere, hasn't gotten on properly, the cell will wait. The spindle will not drag the chromosomes to the poles in a normal cell. And it'll wait until that chromosome gets on. 
So there's a mechanism that detects the number of chromosomes and whether they're all aligned properly. During DNA replication, if there is a break in the DNA, the cell will not form that mitotic spindle and will not condense its chromosomes. It'll wait until that DNA break is repaired. So you can think of the cell with a lot of things going on, like conveyor belts, which are assembling some automobile. And if something didn't get put on at the right time, there's a red button. You push the red button, the conveyor belt stops, people repair the damage, and then you can go on and get an accurate reproduction. Um, and there are similar controls over the centrosome. The DNA is really uh, incredibly complicated in the way its accuracy is controlled. For example, um, what's going on during DNA replication is one of the strands of DNA is being copied by an enzyme to make another strand that's exactly complementary to it. It's reading the information um, like you were a scribe duplicating a sentence. And occasionally, uh, the enzyme will make a mistake and put the wrong thing in, like a misspelled word. That error gets corrected with very high fidelity. Now think about it. You've got a sentence with um, uh, uh, a misspelled word. And if you don't have a dictionary to know how the spelling goes, how do you know which is the right word and which is the wrong word? How do you know which is the mistake? It's a puzzle once it's been done. The way the cell does it is that it marks the old strand of DNA. So it knows which is the right one. And if it comes to a mismatch, to a place where the bases aren't what they're supposed to be, it always takes out the new one and repairs that. So there are a huge number of fidelity mechanisms going on in the cell that we really wouldn't have thought about if we didn't have um, the errors in cancer to make us curious about what's going on. Um, so, I, I've, I've told you two important things about cancer itself. One is that many of the agents which uh, induce cancer uh, in our environment are things that cause changes to DNA. But a second thing is that we don't, the cancer must require many, many changes. And it's not just the environmental exposures, but it's also the intrinsic errors that the cancer cell makes itself that allows it to evolve, develop blood vessels, migrate in the body, and all kinds of other things. Um, so how does that cancer cell become unstable? And what we find is that the very mechanisms that are responsible in the normal cell for assuring these um, uh, correction mechanisms are the things that go wrong in the cancer cell. That is, those early mutations which are um, uh, inducing the cancer will mutate a gene that's responsible for correcting errors. And once that happens, then uh, it's, it's uh, a chaos breaks loose. And in fact, there are rare individuals who are, you know, have mutations that are cancer prone, where the same cancer will occur in a family over and over. And in those cases, they often have inherited a mutation that's defective in one of these controls uh, for repairing uh, and, and uh, correcting mistakes. Mm. Now, uh, another interesting fact about cancer, one of the things that changes in cancer, is um, that cancer cells are immortal. If we put them in a dish and grow them and keep feeding them, they will just keep growing and growing and growing um, until they run out of nutrients and then you can dilute them and they'll do it again. But if we put normal cells into culture, normal human cells, they grow for a while and then they stop. And in fact, the older you are, the less they grow. So the normal aging mechanism is actually uh, represented in the number of divisions that a cell will undergo in culture. 
Um, so hu normal human cells are mortal. Um, they've, they have a defined number of divisions. And cancer cells are immortal. Now, what's causing this? Well, you might imagine that um, the normal cells are running out of some nutrient that the cancer cells don't need anymore. Maybe they make it themselves. Or you might imagine that the normal cells are programmed in some way uh, to prevent them from dividing too many times. The um, Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology or Medicine was awarded this year for um, uh, understanding that basic process, for understanding why cells have a limited number of divisions. And it has to do with some very special sequences which are located at the ends of chromosomes. Now, people realized from the way that DNA replication works, from the way we copy DNA enzymatically, that there was a problem, actually, in du duplicating the chromosome, that the enzyme should have trouble and actually be unable to copy right to the end. And so you would expect uh, from this property that chromosomes would get smaller and smaller every generation. And yet, um, uh, chromosomes are inherited from generation to generation, and that doesn't happen. So that was a puzzle. And the answer to the puzzle turned out to be that there are special sequences at the end of chromosomes which don't use the normal replicating mechanism, but have a special enzyme called telomerase for the telomere, which is this, this particular end. And telomerase is an enzyme that can add these sequences to chromosomes, whereas the normal replication mechanism can't. Now, the explanation for the mortality of normal cells is that most of the cells in the adult body don't have this enzyme, telomerase. It's shut off. And the explanation for the immortality of cancer cells is they turn it back on. They turn it back on so they can duplicate the ends of their chromosomes and be immortal. And what, what these little things are at the end, the way to think of them is they're a repeated sequence of DNA. And it's like uh, going on a Ferris wheel and having tickets. And every time you take a ride, they take one ticket away. And so if you don't have the ability to make your own tickets, eventually you run out of steam, you run out of rides. And in fact, that's what you see in normal cells that are becoming mortal. And uh, is that the chromosome ends are getting shorter and shorter. <clears throat> so, what have we learned about normal cells? And um, what have we learned about cancer cells? Well, what we've learned about normal cells is that they are incredibly um, well designed to prevent exactly this process of cancer happening. The frequency with which it happens from a normal cell is something like you know, 1 in 10 to the 16th cells. And the way it happens is by subverting the normal genetic program of a cell so that a normal cell would never become a cancer cell. It subverts the genetic program so that all these kinds of strange things begin taking place, like the formation of uh, like the synthesis of this enzyme that can duplicate the ends of the chromosomes. Um, now, I'm sure that um, you're interested in more than just the normal cell. You're interested in the cancer cell. And you're interested in knowing what can we use about what we've learned uh, to try to cure cancer. And um, there are a number of different approaches. I'll mention just three quickly. Um, the oldest approach is called chemotherapy, and it's to give substances which are very toxic to growing cells and less toxic to normal cells. It turns out that those chemotherapeutic agents, although not originally uh, realized, um, are DNA damaging agents. And because cancer cells lack the ability to repair damage, and that leads them to make mistakes and evolve, they're also less capable of repairing damage. 
And if you can give them enough damage, you can kill them because they're uh, repair deficient compared to normal cells. It doesn't work very well. It works only in a few cases, but it does, for example, work in childhood leukemia. And the reason is because ch children are tough and they can take higher doses of chemotherapy than adults can. It also works in um, um, testicular cancer, uh, a, a cancer of very young men, probably for similar reasons. But for most of us, chemotherapy is not very effective. A new approach that's being, that's the most popular approach with all the pharmaceutical companies now, and billions of dollars are being spent by every pharmaceutical company, uh, trying to make drugs against the special properties that tumor cells have acquired and normal cells don't normally need in the adult. For example, the growth of blood vessels. Where they're trying to make drugs that inhibit the growth of blood vessels, and that's actually been done, um, hoping that since the adult doesn't need blood vessels, they'll stop the growth of the cancer. The same thing is being done for this enzyme telomerase, which our normal adult cells don't need, but cancer cells need. And uh, uh, drugs are being uh, put into clinical trials right now to try to inhibit that enzyme. And those are good ideas, and they're hopeful, and they may work. Um, the a fundamental problem, though, is the genetic instability of cancer cells and the fact that they will probably find a way to mutate to resistance around any single drug, so that an effective therapy will probably take several drugs, much as it does to control the AIDS virus, which is also uh, highly mutagenic. But I want to end on a hopeful note that um, I am most excited about, and this is um, uh, the role of immunotherapy in cancer. Um, this is a um, slide uh, from the Hutchinson Center showing a, an auditorium, uh, much the size of this auditorium, but these people have all been cured of leukemia or lymphoma at some time in their life. And they were cured by giving them radiation and bone marrow transplantation. Now let me explain what goes on here. This was an idea of Don Thomas uh, more than 40 years ago. Um, being unable to give leukemia patients a high enough dose of chemotherapy, as I mentioned, without killing the patient, um, he reasoned that since the most sensitive part of the human body besides the cancer, the leukemia to radiation or chemotherapy, is our bone marrow that makes our blood cells, very rapidly reproducing cells, that if he could, he could probably give a higher dose of chemotherapy and radiation if he replaced the bone marrow after doing so. So that was the basic idea, and it took a long time, a lot of clinical trials, uh, and eventually it worked. And these people and tens of thousands of people are now cured yearly around the world of leukemia by that very procedure. But it turned out in the course of carefully designed clinical trials that while it worked, the idea was wrong. <clears throat> uh, what's really curing the leukemia is the donor cells, the donor bone marrow, not the chemotherapy and the radiation. It's an immune reaction that the new blood cells have against the leukemia. And they often have a reaction against the rest of the body, too, and people can get serious uh, uh, disease from that, um, uh, from that reaction as well but it, it's capable of curing uh, leukemia. <clears throat> and um, uh, that has led to therapies in which the chemotherapy and the radiation is vastly reduced. And instead of keeping people in the hospital for a month or two, this is now done as an outpatient treatment. They're not even hospitalized. Um, so that's exciting. But I think it's just one step along the way to using immunotherapy for all types of cancer. And um, what is found is that if you take a cancer cell from a patient, this is, represents a cancer cell, um, that you will find immune cells in the body that are reacting against that cancer cell and in culture are capable of killing it. 
Now, if you think about it, that's surprising because the role of the immune system is to recognize foreign things, bacteria, viruses, and get rid of them. And it's very carefully designed not to react against your own body. Yet this cancer cell comes from one of our normal cells. But if you remember everything I've told you, it's no longer normal. That cancer cell is mutating at such a high rate that it's producing different kinds of proteins than a normal cell. And your own immune system can recognize those differences, even if they're subtle, and, and react against that cell. So the Hutchins Center has been doing experiments of this type, isolating T cells from patients, growing them up, putting them back in, and in some cases getting dramatic results. Uh, for melanoma, for example, where patients who have no longer any hope of treatment and have you know, black spots all over their body from metastasizing melanoma, um, frequently go into long-term remission with those spots completely disappearing as a result of that treatment with uh, their own T cells. Um, but it doesn't last usually, it comes back. And we've discovered three things in the last year or two, two or three years that are quite exciting. One is that the T cells you put in don't last very long, they're gone in a week. That's because they're the peripheral T cells rather than the memory T cells. When you have an infection, most of the T cells that are fighting the infection are not going to live very long. But your body puts away some. So the next time you see that infection, those memory cells are ready. And uh, there are memory cells for the cancer too, and we've just learned how to identify them and isolate them. Um, another thing that happens is that the cancer cells very smart critters, uh, secrete things that inactivate the T cells. And those molecules have been discovered and antibodies made to them. And then another part is a helper T cell. But in any case, um, I'll just leave you with a thought that um, I think there is um, serious hope now for harnessing the power of the immune system to recognize these renegade uh, unstable cells that are cancer cells in our bodies uh, and hopefully eliminate them. Thank you.